All right. Good morning. Thank you for connecting with the Pennsylvania Game Commission today. If you're able to hear me and you don't mind sending a note through the control panel to let us know the audio is working, that would be great. Um, today we are recording an event for Game Commission staff members. My name is Lori and I'm fortunate to be joined today by the Game Commission's own Lisa Williams, our grouse and woodcock biologist, and Bob Blightstone, one of our GIS management technicians. And they'll be talking with us about the agency's new grouse priority area sighting tool. We expect the presentation to last about 45 minutes, followed by questions and answers. Uh, you can ask a question by typing into the type question here box on the go to webinar control panel at the right of your screen. Lisa and Bob, thank you for joining us today. Is there anything you'd like to share about yourselves with the audience before we start? Uh, no, I don't think so, except that Bob and I are both a little bit croaky from um, a virus, so <laughs> excuse any <laughs> coughing or throat clearing, but um, thanks everyone for joining. I know your time's valuable, so I really appreciate you um, tuning in for this. And uh, today we're going to talk about um, identifying grouse priority areas which is really has become now the first step in restoring grouse populations. We all know that our grouse population losses have been dramatic over the past 20 years and, and particularly over the past five years. We all know that we need to be more aggressive and committed to creating young forest habitat because that's the only way we're going to slow this decline is through a habitat approach. But the new information that we have now is really how to identify where the best places are to work, where our investment of time and planning and money have um, the highest chance of paying off for grouse. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Bob has created this amazing tool that's available to all of us to use um, to really identify grouse priority areas and cite our projects. Just a little bit of background here before we start on why this is so critically important right now. This graph shows the declines in grouse um, populations in across the mid-Atlantic from 2015 to 2018. So that's those are four-year declines. And you can see the states listed there and you can see the declines in flushes per hour are very dramatic just across that four-year period. Um, the other thing that I think it's important to note is where Pennsylvania lies in this continuum. If we are going to save grouse in the mid-Atlantic as a huntable population and a viewable population, it's going to have to happen in New York and Pennsylvania. We're in the positions where we still have a lot of public lands, an active forestry program, and we still have a lot of birds to work with. So you all know the time to change a problem is not um, at the end of the problem, but toward the beginning of the problem. So we still have enough birds to work with and we have enough public lands and private lands with active forestry to make a difference. If we're gonna make a difference, it's going to have to be our generation. It's gonna have to be us because grouse don't have time for new people to come take our places. We know that this decline is driven by two things, habitat loss and West Nile virus. And so that's why this siting tool takes both of those factors into account. Um, where to focus on habitat based on West Nile virus risk. In the past, we created habitat often um, opportunistically. We would have a biologist who was interested in managing a site or a forester or a land manager had an interest in grouse, and so we put habitat projects there. But because of this disease and because of this rapid decline, we need to be very strategic now about where we put habitat so that the work that we're doing provides the best possible payoff for grouse. We need aggressive habitat management, and more and more now we need targeted habitat management. We need to work harder, but we also need to work smarter so that the work we're doing is immediately helping the situation. 
We want to make sure that every investment we make in grouse habitat has the greatest chance of supporting grouse over the long run. And this tool really shows you where those investments are best made. This is the grouse priority sighting tool. We call it GPAST. I like to say this is how we're going to get grouse past the current situation. Um, it's the product of an amazing collaboration between the South Central Region, the Northwest Region, and the Bureau of Wildlife Management. And I'd like to thank Tim Hoppe, uh, Bob, who's on the webinar today, Clay Lutz, and Jeremy Deal for their hard work and their initiative in really getting this, this product off the ground. In short, this is the best approach for us to get grouse past the current issue. And it's designed to identify areas that have low disease risk and high probability for grouse to respond. We can't really, at this point, directly affect um, disease. We can't control mosquitoes on game lands in any kind of meaningful scale. Uh, we can't wait for grouse to develop an immunity. We're not even sure that they will develop an immunity. So we, it's hard to tackle West Nile virus head on. So we're learning to work around it and work risk with it. So GPAST is looking at, again, where disease risk is low and grouse response should be high. The variables that affect disease risk are primarily elevation, slope, and well-drained soils. To know whether grouse can respond to your work, we're really looking at source populations. You know, are there grouse in an area that can move into the habitat you're creating? And then finally, GPAST is designed to really show opportunities at a landscape scale, because if we're going to hold grouse and restore that population, we're going to need to do it at a landscape scale, not acre by acre. So starting with elevation, I just want to tell you a little bit about why these particular variables are important. This is based on three years of research that we've done so far on game lands, trapping mosquitoes, and in particular, looking for Culex restaurants, which is the mosquito that drives uh, the disease in grouse habitat. And what we have found is that as we climb in elevation, we see these logical threshold points where mosquito abundance Culex restaurants abundance drops with elevation. So we've built these threshold points into the GPAS tool. Slope and soil become important um, because the breeding pools for Culex restaurants tend to be these very shallow, um, heavy soil, not well drained uh, locations, often out in full sun. So if you have these flat areas with uh, very wet soils, then your risk of uh, Culex restaurants population breeding is higher in those areas, particularly if we leave ruts or pools behind as we do our work. Now this is a picture of private lands, um, but you can see this creates really an ideal breeding habitat for mosquitoes. They love shallow, they love full sun, um, and a lot of vegetation in and around the pool. So. Soil and slope are built in as factors also. And then finally, once you've identified a priority area, uh, you want to know if grouse can actually take advantage of the habitat you've created. So GPAST has a, uh, a couple different layers you can look at that tell you whether grouse source populations occur within two miles. Two miles is important because grouse really only make one long distance move in their lifetime, usually during that first autumn. When they disperse from the um, brood, that's when they make their big move. They can go, juveniles typically go one to three miles from where they've hatched. So we use a two mile buffer to show that yes, if you're working in this area, grouse can potentially move in and take advantage of your work. So that's how the factors play into the grouse, the research and the tool. When you combine those factors, you end up with this map of priority areas. <clears throat> it's really sort of arranged, I think of it as a good, better, best scenario. This is showing you landscapes that are most protected from West Nile virus. So orange areas, priority three are good, blue is better, and then the purple is best in terms of long-term grouse 
sustainability in those sites, long-term disease protection. So now we're gonna spend about a half hour showing you the details of how to use the tool itself. And the real beauty of GPAST for me is that you don't actually know how to use GIS to start using it. Um, I'm gonna turn things over now to Bob so he can show us how to kind of work through the tool as we go here. All right, good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us here this morning. Lisa, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. <clears throat> All right, so this is the initial uh, homepage for our ArcGIS Online organization. Most of you uh, should have a license and should be familiar with this view. Um, if you're not, I sent, or Lori sent out a link in the comments section to get you to the internal view of the GPASS tool. Um, so when you get on our ArcGIS Online organization, You'll come over here to groups. And then you'll scroll down to the GPASS grouse mapping group. <clears throat> From there, you'll go under content. And you'll scroll down and what we're looking for is the GPASS mapping tool. And you'll see it's highlighted authoritative um, and says recommended by your organization. So you go ahead and click there and that'll kind of take you to the home page of the tool. So this mapping application um, is designed for use by foresters, land managers, and biologists to be able to prioritize management opportunities for grouse and associated species. So this tool is designed for, as Lisa said, targeted habitat improvement, using technology to aid in decision-making um, with looking at the highest return of interest for benefiting wildlife. So currently it's accessible to select uh, PGC staff within ArcGIS Online. For that, um, regional based staff, including land managers, foresters, and biologists, including GIS staff, and then um, Harrisburg staff as well. So currently we're in the process of getting some more licenses. So if you don't have access yet, just keep in mind the GIS team is working really hard and diligently um, to get those licenses up and they should be available within the next few days. So kudos to them um, for working hard to really pull this off. Um, so in the meantime, if you don't have access, we do have a public version uh, ready to go that anybody can view. And we'll share that out later, but you can always buddy up with somebody else in your region as well. Um, this is a good way to co uh, collaborate. So when you get on the homepage tool here, you can see there's a description of the tool. I encourage you to read it. Um, it's also going to show on the splash screen when you enter the tool. And it takes a few seconds to load. It's definitely bringing up a lot of data here. So like I said, I encourage you to read through the splash screen. Um, it gives you a good background of the tool, kind of helps get you in the mindset for using the tool and some of the different layers that are available to you. If you look down here at the bottom, um, it kind of guides you to a help document and you'll see it up here in white at the top of the screen. That links out to a PDF. That's just a little typed up tutorial that if you ever get stuck, you can always reference that um, for a walkthrough. So you have to check the checkbox here and then hit enter. And so the first thing you'll see is the Pennsylvania state boundary broken out by uh, game lands regions or um, game commission regions and you'll see state game lands there in orange. Now right away you're probably going to realize that all of our state game lands aren't on there um, and there's a reason for that. So if you're looking and the specific game land is not showing on the map or it's not returning in the search bar up here to the top left that means that there aren't any priority acres um, for that game lands. So essentially it didn't meet the elevation criteria or the slope and soil moisture criteria. Um, so what we're looking at with GPASS, like Lisa said, it's a two-step process. We're looking for that A plus B equals C, with C being, you know, where best to implement grouse habitat. So for A, we want to identify that priority area that area that's going to hopefully over the long term buffer grouse from disease. 
And then the B is going to be, is there grouse presence nearby to be able to colonize, you know, that good habitat work that you guys are putting on the ground to really, you know, maximize that return and benefit to the species. So like we said, it's a twofold thing. We like to think of it that you can't have one without the other. So, you know, just because you're working in a priority area and there's, you know, maybe there's no grouse nearby to take advantage of all that hard work and habitat you put in or vice versa, you're working in an area where there's grouse presence, but, you know, maybe it's not in that priority area and it may not sustain over the long term for the population. So definitely want to look for that A plus B effect and that's what we're going to do first. So to do so, uh, we like to start at the game lands level. So you can either scroll in um, with your mouse scroll or you can search by game lands. So I'm gonna search down to game land 61. And you'll see off the bat, the pop-up pulls up and it essentially tells you the game lands number, the region that the game lands is located in, and then the land management group that game lands falls under. And you'll see it also gives you some summary statistics as well. So we're looking at the approximate acres of the game lands here. And then what percentage of the total land mass falls within a priority zone? And you can see the breakdown for priority one, two, and three areas. And then more importantly, kind of from an overall landscape perspective, the total amount of priority acres. Um, so this kind of comes into a good play that, you know, if you're a land manager, you have multiple game lands under your umbrella and you're trying to decide, you know, which one may sustain best over the long term or which one has the most potential, um, you can kind of survey your game lands from this view. So like we said, 61 has about 9,500 acres. If I go over here, game land 62 has about 8,000. Then if I go up here and look at game lands 301, it's only got about 85 um, acres really of priority area. So it's a good way for to kind of think of other areas you may not have considered for management before or start relooking at some other areas. <clears throat> All right, so from there we can zoom into the game lands and that will change the boundary color and show the priority areas. And for here, I'm gonna turn um, the voice over to Lisa so she can explain the different priority area rankings. So again, this gets back to um, what I think is a really intuitive and easy to understand um, way to think about priorities. I think about it as sort of good, better, best. The orange areas would be, um, they have moderate risk to West Nile virus. They tend to be lower elevation or wetter soils, wetter areas. So you're gonna have some risk there it will be moderate, it won't be as bad as if you're not in any priority area, but um, that would be a good area to work. A better area to work would be in blue, that would be our priority two acreage. That's higher elevation and drier soils, so it's gonna be a little more protected from West Nile virus. And then your best areas to work would be priority one, that purple um, view on the map. And that is our highest elevations and dry soils and have the appropriate slopes that we want. So good, better, best. If there's no color in an area in a game lands, it means it's not a priority area. The risk for disease is really just too high, really unacceptably high levels of risk. Now you may have grouse there. They may be feeding in from some of these other acres, but to invest time in doing your habitat work there, um, is not going to result in the benefit to grouse that it would if you were working in a priority area itself. So moving on to um, another game lands, this is game lands 24, which is an active grouse management area and we know it does have grouse on site. We also know because of our uh, West Nile research and our mosquito trapping, we know that there is quite a bit of virus also on this game lands and quite a few of the vector mosquitoes. So this would be an area that I would say definitely continue to manage for grouse, continue the work because you know there are birds there, but I would limit my work really to those priority areas, those thing um, acreages that are showing up as uh, good areas to work. That's where I would start focusing my effort. Really now we're thinking about long-term survival of grouse. 
we know an area may have grouse now, but um, the disease risk just keeps compounding year after year. And for long-term benefit, we really want to focus in those good opportunity areas where grouse are better protected. The other thing is you may see, you know, that's um, maybe a historic grouse management area, but this is a good opportunity to look around at some other game lands too and see if maybe there are game lands that we haven't been thinking about as grouse areas that actually have some really good opportunities. So in this case, if you go north, you look at these game lands um, north of 44, and you see you have you know, more, more acreage to work in, and you also have sites that bump up into that next level of, of priority, those better areas. So like Bob had said earlier, this tool does let you sort of snoop around your game lands and figure out how and where you want to put these long-term landscape scale projects. So after you identify your priority acreage in an area, the next phase, that, that B um, step that Bob talked about, A plus B, the B part is, you know, are there grouse there? Uh, are we going to get a bang for our buck? Okay, I'll think about that for the B step. Um, so are there grouse in that area that can take advantage of the hard work that you're doing? And um, Bob and Jeremy have developed a system where we can see that very quickly. So on, on Game Land 73 here, we can click up, you can see Bob's doing, and look at grouse presence. These green circles are based on eBird data. So that's data that comes in from birders, from the public. They have observed grouse in this area. And it's recent data. It's over the last, what, Bob, I think three years? Yeah, yep, three years. So it's good, solid data. It tells you that, yes, um, you know, even an, un, you know, an untrained casual observer has observed grouse there. The circles represent two-mile buffers, um, and again, that's because grouse disperse about two miles during that first autumn. So if you're working within that area, you have very high likelihood that grouse will move into the habitat you're creating. Now, one problem that we have on some game lands is they're so remote that they really don't get visited much by the public, and so we have this gap in um, coverage for whether there are birds in an area or not. And Game Lands 198 is a good example of that. You'll see that it doesn't have any uh, grouse presence indicated by eBird. And it's probably, I would guess, because it's not really near a population center and it's, it's probably relatively inaccessible and it just doesn't get a lot of birder traffic there. So the wizards of GIS um, Bob and Jeremy have created an internal system, and you'll see he's clicking that now. You can look and see if Game Commission staff have observed grouse. And yes, they have. So even though we don't have those eBird sightings, we have good, solid sightings from Game Commission personnel. And these are recent also. The, this uh, part of the project really just started in July. So these are very recent sightings and really good high quality data. Now this data will get better over time as we're able to roll out um, this app that allows foresters and staff to, to let us know where they see birds. Um, as more people get access to that and start entering their sightings, the coverage by Game Commission staff is gonna get much, much better over time. Now you may be working in an area say this area here in between these sightings, which is very you know, high priority, but it doesn't fall within a grouse dispersal distance. But you work there. So if you know there are grouse there, you're gonna use your, your professional knowledge. You're not gonna be a slave to where these circles are because we know that data will get better and we know that you know, a person in the field can make that determination so you know whether you know, you have grouse. But if you're working in an area where you're unsure, this is an excellent layer um, to the tool. So I think now we've covered uh, the really the basics of how to identify priority areas and 
you know, how to tell whether there are grouse that can take advantage of our habitat work. Uh, you don't need GIS experience. I always make the corny joke that, you know, that I don't even know how to spell GIS, but I'm able to use this tool. You know, Bob um, has made it so simple and so user friendly that it's a tool, it's not an obstacle for us to do our planning. Um, it's really fantastic. It allows you to quickly identify those large scale areas to go investigate and see if there are opportunities, see if there are silvicultural opportunities or land management opportunities in these areas that maybe we haven't been thinking of and we can now prioritize. So now, Bob, we've covered the basics. He's going to give you a quick tutorial for more advanced users, showing you some of the really cool capabilities that are also in this tool if you want to get down to stand level planning. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, so we're going to get into a little more um, advanced planning, I guess I would call it. So utilizing um, the, our agency's other GIS uh, data layers and files to kind of enhance um, our planning, um, kind of bring that data uh, to life in a usable format. So we're going to go out here and look at Game Lands 293. I just arbitrarily picked this one. Um, so we're looking at, all right, it's already got some good priority acres. I'm looking at, you know, priority two and three areas. So we've got that down. And now we want to get that B part of the equation and see if there's presence in the area. And there we go. So we've got grouse presence uh, overlapping with this priority area. So for me, I would, I would want to focus kind of in here for enhancing grouse habitat. So I guess, you know, my next step would be, well, is this area, you know, being actively managed, kind of what, what habitats out there now? Um, so most of you are familiar with our statewide timber block layer. Uh, the GIS staff and forestry staff really try and keep this up to date. Um, and it's nice to get it back in a usable format for some planning here. <clears throat> so when we're looking at Game Lands 293, we can see this tract up here. It's pretty heavily managed um, from the timber block aspect where this tract isn't um, managed as much. So in doing so and turning that layer on, we're able to click inside of a block and see the sale name, the treatment date, what type of treatment it was. So this one's a clear cut and what type of or how uh, large the treatment is. So we're looking about 86 acres and then years since treatment. So we're looking about four years that it's it's been treated uh, in. So there are some other um, filters on here, which kind of get beneficial when you're looking at a larger game lands that has a lot of active management going on. You're able to come into this filter here. It looks like a little funnel on the top left. You're able to turn it on and you can segregate out by treatment type. So if you're looking for just TSIs, or in this case, you're looking at regen cuts, you know, you only want to see your clear cuts and your shelter woods and things of that nature. It, it filters down for that data for you, so it kind of makes it a little more apparent. <clears throat> the same thing, you can filter by treatment type, so if you only want to see clear cuts or thinnings, you're able to do that. One of the more unique aspects is we can look and see stands that have been treated roughly within the past 25 years. So they're still kind of holding in that, um, you know, young forest, early successional type, which is kind of good to know your dispersion across the game lands. Uh, so in this case, you know, we don't have anything in this section. So, all right, that's good. I, I don't have any active management going on. So what resources are available to me? Um, so doing so, you can um, activate the cover stand layer. So that's one that's come out of the comprehensive management uh, planning process that really is an awesome foundational layer uh, for use here at planning uh, within the agency. And so most of you should be familiar with this view of the stand delineations. And then for this instance, this would be a BB12 stand. So we're looking at a Northern Hardwoods um, site one size two stand here. So you're able to click inside that stand And it'll pull up and kind of give you the brief rundown of the stand. So the game lands number, the compartment, and the stand number, uh, what cover type it is, the site and the size, uh, the acres, and what operation zone it is as well, which is important. 
um, to forestry staff. And then any notes that are in there. And so this is live data. So as you know, these are getting updated in the field and uh, through staff. Those changes are reflecting on this map. So it's really, you know, we're very much trying to keep this current and keep it as useful as possible. And, um, you know, forestry has been working really hard with their understory observations and their management table. You guys are able to link out and view that information as well. It's definitely all here at your fingertips for some good planning. And so, you know, you've got all these stands, it's kind of clustered and uh, confusing. So a nice simple filter for just dialing down to just a stand type. You can come over here once again under the funnel. And you're looking for, let's say you're just looking for black cherry stands. You're able to turn the filter on there and just select black cherry. And you'll see it'll reduce all that clutter out of there and just show you black cherry stands. So it you know, kind of really helps dial in on management. And so then we're looking at, you know, one, probably about eight stands here. And then, you know, I'm, I want to look at, okay, is it going to intersect in the priority area? And you can see they're hollow, so you'll see the orange behind there. Um, <clears throat> now, with this stand being a um, size four, but this stand being a size two, you know, this may be ready to be converted. So, you know, you can go out and do your field recon and see if, you know, and make sure ground truth it and make sure it's what you know you expect but you also may want to use some other planning layers as well so are you able to access the stand so that's where we um, turn on the administrative roads here and you're able to see if you have access to a stand or if you would need to do some sort of infrastructure project to be able to access some of these remote areas now, forestry staff has been great with sharing out um, their damage history for damage stands. So that's one of the priorities um, for forestry is getting in and working in these damaged stands. So with GIS, we can really take like a two or multi-tiered approach to, you know, checking off some of these priorities we have as an agency. So like I said, we were lucky enough for them to share out this uh, damage stands data. So now we can, in the table or the layer list here, turn on the damage stands and be able to see where those are overlapping priority areas as well. And you're able to click within that area and it will return for you and tell you, you know, <clears throat> what what agent or what, you know, damage event happened. Was it a frost? Was it, you know, a caterpillar tent worm of some sort? It would tell you the species that was affected in the year. Um, so really helping to drive that, you know, regenerating those damaged stands and also being able to provide good habitat at the same time. Um, it's a great way to cite that. So I'm just gonna walk through some of the other um, functions and um, features of the web map here. So you're able to search, like I said, by game lands, by region, um, by WMU. And like I said, if it doesn't return, then that means there's no priority areas. So through, we'll walk through the toolbar here. So there's the little funnel icon there. And this uh, essentially filters um, data out of the map for you. So for grouse observations, you're able to, you know, see if grouse have been observed over the past month or three months or areas where multiple grouse have been observed, not just one. You know, so if you're looking to really make an impact with grouse presence, there's gonna be a lot of those, you know, multiple returns in there. And then for game lands that have, you know, a lot of priority areas and you're really like looking at a lot <laughs> to take in there, you can filter down just by priority area. You know, so in a case like this, I may want to just look at priority one areas. And that really helps me to kind of define in on, on which area, you know, I, I, I would want to focus on. And then we had already talked about the cover stand and the timber block filter functions as well. And for some of the advanced users, if you click that little logo on the bottom right, you can build your own expression as well. So you can query and select through any of the layers um, available in the map. So that's a unique customizable function there as well. <clears throat> so the next one is the add data tool. Um, so anybody in our ArcGIS online organization has access um, to a lot of GIS data that's hosted in that service. 
that the GIS staff works really hard to maintain and, and make available to everybody. So through accessing our GIS online organization, you're able to go in there and copy the URL from a select feature service or layer and actually paste it in here and add it right to the map. So say you wanted to look at food plots on that game lands at the same time, you would just go out to the feature service in ArcGIS Online, copy that URL from the feature and paste it right in here and it would add it into the map for you. It's not gonna persist over multiple iterations of the map, it'll just be for the login session you have. And then you can also upload your own files. So if you have shape files for a specific project, you can add them here. If you have um, KML files on Google Earth, you can add those in as well. And then same with uh, GPS files from a Garmin. You can drop those in as well. So it might be beneficial to some of the diversity biologists for being able to add some of those boundaries in there and see where those priority areas line up. And that may be a little easier to do um, on the public facing version. But that functionality is built in here as well. So we have the measure tool where you can measure area and distance. Most of you are familiar with that. And then we have the print function as well. And that will essentially export a PDF um, for you to be able to print of the map you're viewing on your screen. And then you have this little information button here, which essentially walks you through what I'm explaining now. Just a nice little refresher in case you get confused or lost that you can come back and reference um, and get back on your way with things. So we have links up here to Lisa's awesome educational videos regarding grouse that she's done over the past few years. So you can click out and link to those on our YouTube page. And you, like I said, can also access the help document, which links you out to a PDF and walks you through what we've talked about today. Then over in this top right corner, you can see we have our legend, which is gonna show us anything that's showing on the map and explain the symbology behind it. And the little stack of papers is all the different layers that we have built on the map available um, for all of you to use for planning purposes. So you just check them on and off like you normally would on ArcGIS. Then this little quadrant square over here will give you different base map options. So you may wanna look at some imagery of stuff before you head out and do your field recon aspects. So that's all built in there and available to you. Um, in regards to what Lisa had said um, with the observation tool, um, our staff is working very hard to get that out and available to everybody um, for documenting those observations. So that should be coming, I would think, within the next week or so. So definitely be on the radar for that. There's a lot of exciting um, benefit of that application. So I encourage everybody to use that as well when it comes out. All right, and I think I'm ready to share it back over to Lisa. Lisa, do you want me to share my screen or do you want to stay on this view here? Um, share your screen, please. Okay. Thanks. Yep. So um, that was a really quick tour, but I think that it gives you some um, idea of the power of this planning tool. Now, we, we call it Grouse Priority Area Siting. The actual siting is based on West Nile virus risk. And we now know that grouse are not the only bird or the only um, mammal, only wildlife in Pennsylvania that are um, threatened by West Nile virus. So this tool, the sighting part, can be used for other species that we know are vulnerable to West Nile virus. And because of the role of elevation, it can also be used for species that, um, that are associated with high elevation. So I'm looking, did you turn the screen back over to me, Bob? I thought I did, I'm sorry. So that's the one thing, this is a quick tour. There's a lot of information, but um, I want, want to just let you know that this will be put on YouTube and we'll be sharing that link so that you can review the tool and how to use it the next time you start planning a project. I know that right now you may not be planning something and, and you know, you may forget the fine details when the time rolls around. So this will be on YouTube um, and you'll be able to access it whenever you, whenever you need it. This is uh, 
the logo, if you look sort of behind the logo here, you'll see that what we show to the public is, are the grouse priority areas. Uh, we will not be showing the public where those grouse populations occur. And I ask you to use discretion with that information. That grouse presence data, I ask that you not share that beyond the agency. You don't share any of those maps or screenshots beyond the agency. And that's because we don't want it to be used um, to target grouse populations. So it won't be viewable on the version of GPASS that goes out for public use, but there will be a link so that any um, public partner that's planning a project can contact me very easily, very quickly, and I can confirm to them that yes, they have a source population in the area, or no, they don't. Um, so they'll have access to you know, being able to get the information, but they will not see that grouse presence um, map. So, and then just in the next couple minutes, I just want to show some um, interesting uh, findings that we had as we were developing GPAST. It's, uh, we've seen it supported and ground truth, actually, as we were developing it. So, I want to stress this isn't a modeling exercise. It's really a tool. It's based on real world data. And we're now seeing that it actually is playing out on the ground in many cases. Um, so I just want to show you a couple of examples of that. The most heartbreaking one personally for me is Gamelands 176, Scotia Barrens and Center County. As you know, it was uh, managed intensively for more than 25 years for grouse habitat. It was the gem in the crown for grouse management in Pennsylvania. And in 1994, that management was paying off, you know, incredibly, really up through the early 2000s. Um, that grouse management was producing an incredible abundance of grouse. In fact, we it had abundances as high as Wisconsin. So we were we were hitting the marks for, for Great Lakes states in the mid 90s. That population crashed pretty quickly when West Nile virus came through. And now, as of spring of this year, um, we surveyed eight miles and heard two drummers. And last month, I heard from a bird dog club that had conducted a field trial there. They ran, uh, you know, competitive level dogs over 13 miles of transects, and they had zero grouse flushes. So that population is. Um, not looking sustainable. And if you look to the right here, it doesn't show up as a priority area in GPAST. It's, it's low and it's wet. Um, and so the model, you know, the tool predicted that grouse were not sustainable on this site. The good thing is the tool also tells you where grouse are more sustainable. So, you know, the heartbreak is Scotia. Um, the opportunity lies to the west and to some other game lands. So you can use this really to start being very strategic about where we make future investments. Um, so that's an example where GPAST was, was played out on the landscape, showing that, yes, birds were declining in these areas that are um, highly susceptible to disease. We also have the opposite, fortunately, uh, where grouse management be is focused in priority areas, and we are seeing grouse respond positively. So this is the Loyal Sock State Forest. Um, back in 2016, the forester there identified this um, grouse priority area that he wanted to work in because he had seen it law lose um, so many birds, and he wanted to try to restore the, that area's population. Just um, when I looked at his management site through GPAST, it almost looks like he cheated. You know, he, his professional knowledge led him really directly to um, priority areas for grouse. So this was an, a neat case where, you know, the forester knew and uh, the tool confirmed, yes, this is a good area to work. And this shows you the grouse response in 2004. He had 17 um, 
solid bird dog points <laughs> in that area, and that population crashed then over the next couple years. In 2017, he started implementing these patch cuts. In 2018 um, and 2019, you see the increase of grouse over time really phenomenally fast in my mind. There, it's, it's incredible that we have six drummers in 32, a 32 acre area. And to me, that really highlights how hard up they are for good high quality habitat. So um, this is a great example where you put aggressive management in a high priority area. And even with disease, you see the grouse population responding beautifully. So the tool has been ground truth. We're gonna see more and more of that, I think, as we get hit with um, severe disease years, we're going to see that these priority areas in the tool are really areas that we need to be focusing on. So just to wrap up, again, I say the tool, it was developed for grouse, the siting, but it really helps us tick off a lot of objectives as an agency. If you're a forester, you know you're working for forest health and resilience, forest regeneration, and that we need to rebalance the four stage classes across the Commonwealth. The tool can help you do that. That stand level planning information is really nice to be able to see um, at a large scale to help with planning. And by creating Young Forest for Grouse, you're meeting those objectives, silvicultural objectives as well. If you're a land manager or really any staff and you're working on comprehensive game lands plans or figuring out your annual work objectives, the tool can help inform that. Where is the best place to work? Where's the most feasible place to hold grouse? Where can we get the best bang for the buck? And um, if we're working internally or with partners on funding proposals for grouse or other young forest species, we now have this map, this tool that says, yes, in our proposal, we are working in the best areas for grouse, the best areas for these young forest species. So it can really strengthen a funding proposal that you might be developing um, or that we might be developing in, with our, our uh, non-governmental partners. And then finally, again, we know that grouse are not the only species that are uh, vulnerable to West Nile virus. There's more and more information coming out almost every year on the impact among bird species. Um, and we know that even some mammals are vulnerable. So the siting is important for a diversity of species, and then also your high elevation um, species that because the tool has such an elevation component in it, it can be useful for siting projects there too. So that's just um, to wrap up here. There's a link. You can find more information on our rough grouse page or by contacting me or Bob. Uh, we will be also producing this public tool that our partners and even you know private landowners can use and so we'll be getting this information out through press releases with easy easy to find links on the web page and really try to get it out there so people start using it um, i have been contacted by other states who are interested in developing their own version so i think uh, there is a lot of interest in this project in this tool it's the first of its kind as far as we can tell in the nation and we have really high hopes that it will allow us to strategically restore grouse in the commonwealth and with that we'll take any questions absolutely type questions into the type question here box and we can share them with lisa and bob we have shared the link to the staff access to gpast in the chat box we can also send that out in a follow-up email to all the folks that registered. Looks like you guys did a brilliant job of explaining everything. There are no questions yet. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Emily asks, can you export shape files? From the tool uh, so you can export them from the tool however through the ArcGIS online gpass group 
there's a whole slew of data in there and you're able to export that and save it or you can add it directly into Arc Pro. So that data is available out there um, in the ArcGIS Online GPASS group. So yeah, there's ways for you to be able to source that data. Um, and Emily, I do believe you have a license and access in there currently. Thank you, she says. <laughs> <laughs> So again, this will be housed on YouTube. I know right now you may not be actively planning a project. Um, and if you're like me, you you know, you tend to really want to dig into things when you're actively working on uh, something. So this will be housed on YouTube so that you'll be able to refer back to it when you get to the point that you are planning a project. Or if you have someone else that you're working with and you want to you know, be able to refer them to this site um, so that they can come up to speed on it also. Okay. So I, th I think, uh, I don't see any other questions. Staff, you guys know how to get a hold of Lisa and Bob if you would have questions later. Um, and like Lisa said, you'll be able to find it on our public YouTube page. Uh, I'm not surprised that other states and other agencies are going to be interested in this tool. I think it's so super cool. So thanks all for joining us, and you can look forward in a couple days on our YouTube channel if you need to go back and review. Thanks so much.